Okay, we're gonna start, and, and I'm so, I'm sorry I'm back. So the bad the bad news is I'm back. The good news is I'm back as a moderator, so I'm not gonna talk much. Um, and I am delighted that we have two very special people on this panel to talk about investing in emerging markets. On my left, immediate left, Rebecca, who's the head of international research and strategy at Nationwide Investment. She brings a wealth of expertise, and her comparative advantage, they both have absolute advantages, but her comparative advantage on this panel is the top-down view of where emerging markets fits in an overall asset allocation. Next to her is Robert, the founder and CIO of Gramercy, a very successful, bottom-up driven emerging, emerging market hedge fund that I have gotten to know and, and, and appreciate and respect and work for even more in the last few months. And he's gonna provide the bottom-up complement, but both of them are going to talk about top-down and bottom-up coming together and what does that mean for emerging market investment. The narrative arc of the discussion is we're gonna start with the general investment environment. Where does EM fit in all this? What in particular makes sense and doesn't make sense in EM? Then we're gonna to turn to you to see if there's any questions. If not, I'm gonna continue um, asking questions. And then to have some fun and put them on the spot, I'm gonna play a long, short game with them at the end. Um, we're gonna go till 9.50, and if I look at my phone, I'm not checking about my, where my daughter is, although I would love to, okay? But I don't have a watch anymore. Okay, so Rebecca, let me start with you. Um, from yesterday, from today, we're coming from a world that at one point was unthinkable. We're coming from a world of 15 to 17 trillion of negative yielding bonds. We're coming from a world where investors have made money both on the risky side of the asset allocation and the risk mitigation side. Okay, you've been paid for both, which is great. We're coming from a world where we could rely on ample and predictable liquidity from central banks. How do you interpret the world we've come from? Where do you see us going and what does it mean for, for how you think about asset allocation at nationwide investment? Thank you. Um, I'll keep it focused on emerging markets. Uh, let me describe to you a world uh, that we are actually really coming from. Um, China growing at 10 to 14, 15% growth rates in certain years. Um, a commodity boom that had been focused on really one thing, the rise of emerging markets, the support of commodities, so any resource uh, country could benefit from that, resource uh, corporate could benefit from that. Um, accumulation of reserves, a shift in issuance from hard currency as reserves were topped out to local currency, uh, better financial systems, better liquidity, um, and then the, the environment changes. Uh, we have hit, hit a global macro political geopolitical shift in the tone, uh, and at the same time the market structure is shifting. Uh, the Fed, global central banks are buying debt pushing the likes of us out to find other opportunities, whether that's less liquidity, lower credit, or trying to give on liquidity and maintaining good credit work. Um, we're in a, a pinnacle period where we're trying to figure out where is the future of emerging markets. It's not a one-way street anymore. It's not just anybody tied to resource boom or China. China's restructuring, and at the margin, it's going to slow. Growth is going to slow. They may be opening up their capital markets, but the macro implications are very different compared to the way they used to be. Is the issuance pattern going to be so robust? Will it move in that structural trend of more local currency, better financial systems? You know, I don't know. Um, I do know that there is a test on valuations. The central banks are in there. The global emerging market landscape has benefited, absolutely. Um, we're interested in doing where I think the asset class is going to become more idiosyncratic. It's not a one-way street anymore. Do your bottom-up credit work. That's what we're trying to do. Um, what we started to do, we're very domestically based, and we're trying to move it internationally to get some diversification. We're first starting to understand how the world around us impacts our U.S. domestic assets. Then we can start to understand what an emerging market looks like. So, Bottom-up credit work, more idiosyncratic, not an asset class trend. 
that's the way that I'm looking at emerging markets in this landscape. So let me ask you one, one follow-up question before I pass, pass on to Robert. This notion of it's no longer a one-way street, but we had this wonderful secular tailwind that has stopped. Um, I'm often struck by this, this, this statistic. If you had invested in the S&P in 2015 and sold a few months ago, you would have made 160%. If you had invested in EM equities, EEM, and sold, you would have made zero. So how do you bring in valuations for someone who's, who's very naive, says, well, everything you say is right, but look at the valuation differential. Surely it's time to fade the US and go into EM, regardless of whether the tailwind has ended or not. What do you say to them? I would, I, personally, I would agree. Um, the strength is in EM, the growth is in EM. I mean, just ostensibly looking at the potential returns, as you mentioned social returns. I mean, there are huge social returns to just simple reforms. Uh, we've, we've already started the low hanging fruit. There's a, a di more difficult reforms ahead, but I would agree agree with that. It's just, it's not that you can just get into any EM market. I think there's going to be a differentiation across the asset class, uh, even within different currencies that you need to, we are talking this morning at the, the, there's been secular trends that have defined a macro strategy, especially in asset allocation, without a clear knowledge of what the three to, next three to five years is going to look like, it's hard to EM, yeah, invest in just EM as an asset class. So what I'm suggesting is I agree, there's lots of diversif diversification benefits getting out of the dollar, getting out of US assets, getting out of developed market assets, especially negative yielding ones. Um, but do the, the work needs to be done. I mean, there are major, major, the, the big economies in EM are, you know, China, India, Brazil, Russia, uh, make your bet across those. That, that's what I'm suggesting is it's, it is a, a country selection these days, I believe, at a macro point of view, it's no longer an asset class selection. So Robert, two, two hypotheses for you to react one, to. One is no longer a one-way street. Two is that means that the investment opportunity is not the asset class as a whole, it is selectively within the asset class. Can you re react to both? Sure, and they're, they're obviously correlated, but I, but I would agree with this notion that this label of emerging markets um, is a bit intellectually lazy. Um, I've been in the asset class actually in, in, since before it was an asset class, and then it, they just called it EM. Um, and it was kind of risk on, risk off, and it was this appendage, and you didn't really get paid to think about differentiation within emerging markets um, as an asset class. So we think about it in the way that we've evolved our platform is around the different return streams that are available in emerging markets. And to think of emerging market return streams on a blank piece of paper, and then see um, where where the best return is relative to an objective and relative to the to the risk that, that you can tolerate. But you know, people always ask me, you know, where do you invest? Do you do emerging markets? And and I take kind of the old world approach, which is, I, I don't I don't want the World Bank or Goldman Sachs or someone else, but or J P Morgan to tell me where I can invest because they've created an index. But uh, I kind of look at the uh, you know still what I call the former Soviet Union and, and Eastern Europe, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, and then dig in, or people like to use terms like frontier markets. Well, everywhere that you and I have ever invested at one time was a frontier market. So um, I don't want to eliminate things just, just for the sake of, of labels. So, so w one of the issues with the emerging markets has been the structural imbalance between the dedicated, dedicated investors who think like the two of you, and then the crossover investor who thinks much more generally, and, and these days increasingly has come in index products, so with low cost index products. Speak a little bit about what does that mean for the world you live in? To what extent is that a frustration yeah. or is that an opportunity? All of the above. So, um, you know, I, again, ha having spent 32 years in emerging markets and we've been talking to this conference for the last two days about global liquidity and how much, you know, how many dollars are floating around. And I'll just stop and say that in the 32 years, it's certainly in the 25, past 25 years, I think emerging markets fixed income, particularly in corporates, is potentially as illiquid as it's ever been, right? And then, and then now we have to talk about where, where that risk resides, where it used to be and where it is today. So if I go back to emerging market corporate credit back you know, before the crisis, it tended to reside in a 90-day vehicle called a hedge fund. And post the crisis, you know, allocators said, whoa, 
that 90-day vehicle, way too liquid for the underlying illiquidity of the emerging market corporate debt. So we're going we're gonna to redeem, and we're going to go do something safe. We're going to get liquid, and we're going to go buy ETFs. We're going to go buy USITs, and we're going to go buy 40 acts. And what do they do? As we were liquidating the bonds, they bought those same bonds and put them into one-day vehicles. So we went from 90-day money to, to, to one-day money. But that's only part of the story. The rest of the story is, since 2010, emerging market corporate credit in QCIP form is about five times larger than it was. Uh, you know, today it's five times larger than 2010. And the street, you know, there used to be this notion of broker dealer. Well, the D is gone. Everybody's a broker. And we've not really seen the impact of it yet because as the market has grown, there's been inelastic supply. At every price, there's an issuer that's always willing to take money from the market. And we take somewhere like Brazil, and they've issued at 4%, and they've issued at 14%, and, then, and everywhere in between. But demand itself won't be inelastic when there are outflows, and it, there will be outflows. And uh, there's this complacency out there as though the, the current allocation is the one that everybody's going to keep forever. Uh, what I'm concerned about and also excited about is this dislocation that's going to occur. And as you were saying in your previous panel, um, if you understand that, you embrace it, and you underwrite it today, there's a huge opportunity. And we call it you know, plan the trade and, and, and trade the plan. Um, but wouldn't you have liked in 2006 and 2007 to have calmly underwritten the credit crisis, said, this is silly, this can't go on forever, I don't know how long it'll go on, but in March of 2009, to have some sort of drawdown structure in place where you plan the trade, trade the plan, and all the psychologies out of it, and that you pre-committed your governance committees to that structure, that to me is you know, following up from your conversation this morning, how, how to embrace the, the volatility. So Rebecca, talk about that. In particular, talk about in the, in the context of a traditional governance system where you have very well-defined asset classes, mm -hmm. right? And we heard two things is EM is no longer a simple asset class. It has features that go all over the place. And two, and I don't know whether you agree with, with Robert, but this powerful notion of his of illiquidity in the midst of global liquidity. How do you, how do you talk to people who are conditioned to think in a certain way? Well, it's funny because we put our, uh, at Nationwide, we put our EMD products uh, into a class called liquid alternatives, which is just silly to me. Uh, EMD, even in the past to me, does not seem to be all that liquid, especially when you want to sell or you, need to, or you never need to buy. Um, <clears throat> so we've already kind of come to the understanding that EMD really isn't all that liquid. And, and I agree that it seems, especially if the asset class is no longer going to be on a one-way street, it's going to be more uh, idiosyncratic, you're going to need to find those pockets of liquidity. We are actually, our strategy is more barbell than the way we think of liquidity in investment-grade corporate public credit markets. And then we've got a slew of asset classes that are very illiquid, uh, that we're very comfortable with our bottom-up credit work. Um, EM, though, I think is, is very prone to this these gaps in liquidity and this re, very quick repricing. And it's just because the market structure has changed so much. Where is the lending coming from? Where, you know, what is the actual real debt load? You know, I was just reading a Moody's report and they had increased the number of sovereigns that were rated by something like 100 to 106 just over the last year, largely in Africa. Africa is the growth story, you know, population growth. They've got resources if they just reform. Every single one of those, in the public markets on the sovereign side, every single one of those issues are oversubscribed. They just can't issue enough paper. People want it. And I think there's, you know, there are pockets of areas of the world, even emerging markets, whatever that, I like to call the, what the World Bank calls it, low and middle income countries, um, where you are going to be susceptible to poor credit work done along the way. And I think um, over at the Kiel Institute, they've done some really neat research on China's capital lending programs and, and, and global capital flows. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with this. But basically, there's a whole ton of hidden capital coming from China. And they accumulate, they estimate on the low end around $200 billion, uh, through 2016. And we've had three years since then. Um, these are hidden debts. This is not measured by the rating agencies. This is not measured by the IMF, the World Bank, because China's not part of the... Um, Paris Club, so they don't have to. Uh, they have reporting suits. So I think there's all sorts of uh, skeletons that will come out of the markets, and that is in the emerging market space, and um, come, come out of the closet. And I think, again, if you just do the credit work and you understand that there are uh, skeletons, and you can sit through the liquidity events, you're going to be confident in the credit work that you've underwritten going into it. And I, 
Um, I think that's one thing we talked about this morning that I was very attracted to in terms of your uh, opportunity set at Grammar Theme. And I think the barbell that, that you spoke of is, is the way that we're thinking about it, which is, and we heard all day yesterday that you know people need return. So you need to take risk to get return, but you need to take intelligent risk. And I think the intelligent risk in emerging markets today is to, you know, one, um, if you've got a liquidity in your portfolio, make sure that it's your potential liquidity that you've underwritten high quality credit and probably of short duration. I'm not saying you have to get out of every QSIP in, in your portfolio, but to the extent that you really don't need one day liquidity, you can move out the illiquidity spectrum. And you know, when you talk about equity returns, you know, if you were sitting in private credit contractual income in emerging markets over that same period of time, you may not have kept up with the S&P, but you definitely kept up with the returns that your endowment or your pension fund, fund needed. But so I think that the, the barbell that we're thinking about is underwrite, take down the risk that you really get paid. And for me today, that's private credit in emerging markets. We'll talk a little about that. Uh, you get much higher yields. You get explicitly paid for the illiquidity and you get less risk because you have great security packages. Um, and then the other part of the barbell which is kind of embracing that dislocation before it occurs, having some cash, having the courage to have some cash, understanding the option value of cash. But then let's unpack what those dislocations have looked like and what are the return potentials that have come behind them. Um, and I think it's fair to assume that you know there's there's been nine in the last 20 years. The peak to trough's been down about 20%. We're talking about bonds here, fixed income, liquid bonds in emerging markets. Peak to trough down 20% in five months. In 12 to 24 months, the returns have been 30 to 50 percent. Now, I personally think it's those returns at that part of the cycle that are not only obviously the most interesting, but the ones that have driven a lot of capital into long-only emerging market debt. So I'd rather like to think about a counter-cyclical and underwrite it before it happens. It's going to happen. You know, just, just like the taper tantrum. You know, we, we did the same thing before the taper tantrum. Underwrite it. It's going to happen. When it happens, you calmly take it down, and you're pre-committed. Because you know, I, I started my firm during the Russian debt crisis, and I ran around and told a lot of LPs, a few in the room here, that you know Russia's really cheap at six cents, and most of them were under the table, licking their wounds. You couldn't get them on the phone, and you couldn't get anybody on the phone in March of '09. So, you know, what I'm saying to people now is, let's have the conversation now. It's calm. Let's underwrite it. When it happens, let's take advantage of it. So, so there's a reason why you can't get them on the phone, right? Um, so let me take two examples um, that you've cited previously. I've heard you cite them, and, and how do you explain them? Because on paper, they make no sense. One is Mexico. You have a choice. Either you lend to Pemex via the public markets at 4%, or you can lend via opportunities that you source at double digit with better collateral, okay? And yet, this is crowded, this is not. Argentina, the 100-year bond at 7.25% was oversubscribed. At 30 to 40 cents, no one wants to touch it. Okay, so, so talk a little bit about, about when, when you're sitting in front of people and they see these big contrasts, wh how do you explain to them to get over the, the behavioral um, challenges that make you do the wrong thing at the wrong time? Yeah, we typically, typically talk about... And then I'm going to come to questions, by the way, so... We talk about, you know, and th those situations are a little bit different. There's something broken, there's some element of distress, and for something to be cheap, not just cheaper than it used to be, you have to be able to clearly identify like what's the element of distress. Um, and then number two is like what's the catalyst that's going to change the element of distress because things can stay cheap for long periods of time. And you talked about Greece at negative yields a while ago. Well, there was a time that you know, Greece was trading at 60 and 40 cents and people would come to me and say it's cheap and why don't you get involved? And I said, well, it's just cheaper than it used to be because when you run a debt sustainability analysis, this is a 20 cent asset. So in the case of Pemex, you know, 4% for liquid credit versus 15% or 17% for illiquid credit, I think part of it's the way that the markets are, are, are organized today, that, that uh, everybody has to, quote, stay liquid, and they're not allocating some capital towards the illiquid. But what's broken is the banks, the prop desks. You know, we used to compete with prop desks on every, every desk on the street, and uh, they would crowd us out. Not, now they're not there. And you know, we talked about Turkey earlier, too. It's like you, know, you can write mid-teens paper in Turkey only because the banks that used to spoil all the borrowers there aren't, aren't lending anymore. So that's, that's something broken there. When you take the case of Argentina, you know, Argentina is this, it's this feast or famine asset, and it's a great example of, of what we've seen in emerging markets for, for long periods of time. But I also think it's a good indicator of what you can expect as, a, as I've talked about these, these dislocations. You know, at the first part of the cycle, when it was trading at 40 cents, 
the you know the the real money long onlys of the world didn't want to participate in it. I think you even said maybe it was one of the most painful not, things not to have in your portfolio at one period of time. Nobody wants nobody wants to have it because all they're seeing is yes, yesterday's risk and they're not seeing what they're getting paid for. Uh, then you get uh, the transformation and you get the the hundred year bond. When they issued that hundred year bond, they'd been in default in twenty nine out of thirty five years. That's when we decided to return about a billion dollars of capital to our LPs, and we said, you know what, it's kind of over. That 40 cent bond's now trading at 118. Uh, we'll give you a call when it's back. And I think the, uh, the other factor is- Did you make the call? We, we did, we did. We, and, uh, and what sort of reception did you get? Uh, about two thirds of it's come back. So look, I mean, that's, that's the way we've, we've thought about emerging markets. It's a dynamic asset class. I don't wanna, and, and, and multiple return streams. But for us, it's not about, Let's be in Argentina forever. It's not, it's, you know, there's times where it makes sense in absolute terms and times when it makes sense in, in relative terms. Uh, a hundred year bond at seven and an eighth, uh, trading up to 105 made no sense to us. That same bond trading sub 40 uh, makes a lot of sense to us. Questions, I can go on and we'll go on. Um, questions? Go ahead, please, sir. Robert, yesterday at around Yeah. So, so let me just repeat the question for, for people. Um, speak to this notion of credit culture yeah, in emerging market investing. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think emerging markets credit is like all other credit, but then there's a lot more work. And I think at the end of the day, uh, you're underwriting people. You know, and we talk about jurisdiction, you know, is it under New York law or UK law or what have you? Uh, what are the collateral structures you have? But you know, all that's a risk mitigation tool, a risk management tool if you make a mistake on people. So the, so the first thing we think about is, who are the people that we're lending to? Uh, whether that's, you know, who's the president, who's, who's the CFO, who's the CEO, who's the family behind it? What's, what has their behavior in the past been in times of duress to predict how they may behave in the future? Um, and that's all, that's all analysis of, of people and, and the notion of culture. And sometimes I'm too tight of a bias on credit culture, but you have these tire treads on your forehead that remind you of, of mistakes you've made. And, you know, I, I still think of Columbia as, as a culture of payment. You know, they pride themselves on the fact that they didn't go into the Brady debt restructurings when everybody else did. And I can still see that in corporate obligors today in conversations that you have. Uh, we talked about Mexico yesterday. I think it's a, it's a culture of collection. You know, if you work the credit and you have good credit rights, you'll get paid. It may take a little bit more work. We've been in other jurisdictions where maybe um, credit culture is an oxymoron, where ultimately they can have a, a a bankruptcy that occurs in a remote place that creditors aren't present and you read about what you're getting in the morning. I'm not interested in that culture. So I think at the end of the day, if, if, if you do your people analysis right and your culture analysis right, then you only have to rely on the jurisdiction and the collateral. And Rebecca, how easy is it to judge credit culture? I, <laughs> um, credit culture I think is very difficult, especially in the shifting political environment from the top down. Um, we were talking about earlier just how you were just brought up the example of CEOs being kind of side uh, heavy handed into acting or running their business in a very a different manner. That's going to filter down to the, 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 the culture of a, any corporate. Um, I will say we look to corporates as a spread above. I mean, we like the spread. Uh, we are more confident in the ability to assess a corporate structure rather than a sovereign structure. And so we do believe in the, the future of uh, emerging market corporates. I, on your point about ability to strategically react to gaping uh, liquidity events, we're good at not selling. We have a, a very well-defined investment thesis and we're confident where we are. But taking advantage of the gape events is proving to be more challenging for us since we don't really know where we are. So we know where we've been but we don't know where we are, so therefore, how can we be confident about where we're going? And from an investment strategy point of view, I think that is difficult, and it creates asset allocation at a very broad level. Um, it, it creates, it, it, that makes it a little bit problematic in terms of having confidence. So we're increasingly looking to the bottom up to understand where we are and where we're going to go. So that's earnings, that's cultures, that's uh, really relying on the bottom up. Uh, more so than I ever have before. And I agree, I agree that we, we don't know where we are. 
but we can plan for different places that we might be. Mm -hmm. And Muhammad, I know you like football, even though it's challenging of years it's been for the Jets. But you know, the, you had to say it. You just had to say it, right? The 49ers are eight no, by the way. Yeah, they're back. Um, but you know, the PMs in the room there with me, they they know that when I hire them, they they get the the wristband that the quarterback wears, and it says plan the trade and trade the plan. And the idea is that you open it up. We don't know where we are, but we can make plans for you know if it's fourth and one, if it's you know two minute drill, so that when we get there. It's just calm. You know, they, they only have 30 seconds to get the ball up, right? We're the same thing. And when, when that, you know, these, these V-shaped recoveries happen very quickly. So I don't know what it's going to look like, but I could set up plans for different places that we might end up. And that's what I'm asking LPs to do at the same time is think about it now. Uh, and let's, you know, let's, let's put the wrist brand on. And then when we get to, you know, third and, third and 10, we, we know what to do. Okay, there was a question there. Um, is it still there? No. Okay, we have one here. Before that, let me just say that the Jets have a very easy answer. Just give the ball away. You don't have to worry about what comes next. <laughs> Please, sir. Uh, uh, one of the really instability and driving to buy model uh, world is that because uh, tech uh, technology, uh, especially in the specific uh, technologies in the area of digital uh, transformation and also the global connectedness uh, by this digital enabled. Uh, a breakdown on the classical barriers. And uh, in the emerging market, you're really dealing with many chances. You have a different type of boundaries. Uh, is that uh, with this uh, uh, really smart people, could that we redesign the boundary and the global connections to help those people can have the foresight to take the unfair advantage from those which does not have the insight, the digital connected world to be redesigned so then we can uh, balance the vulnerability while still uh, uh, and the global capital growth. Great question. And, and let me generalize it to technology, climate change, and demography is making the, the bimodal world more likely. So, so, so is it an opportunity to leapfrog is what I hear you say, to leapfrog for emerging markets, or is it just a set of, of additional headaches? How do you think about? Oh, well, I, I think that all those the objectives and uh, degree of planning in any one of those areas for any particular market, market sovereign or corporate is going to justify investing in that, that corporate or sovereign. I mean, those are the objectives. Those are the... The IMF, also, many central banks, not the U.S., for example, but because clearly across Europe, climate change is very, very important. So coming in line, that's one reason you like or people have liked in the recent past uh, Central and Eastern Europe. They're ahead of the game in terms of climate change, climate change and that's an objective driven by the EU as, as a whole. So I think any emerging market that can accommodate that, investors will want to be a part of that growth. Robert? I was going to respond to the digitalization part. And I think the, the, the cool thing about digitalization as it relates to emerging markets is, is the transparency of information and, and the quickness of the, the transmission of that, of that information. And that's always been a, one of the disadvantages in EM as an investor is, you know, can you get good information and can you get timely information and, and reliable information? And so I think the digitalization, you know, really simple strategies like, you know, data mining, social media, to observe events is available today where it wasn't five or 10 years ago. And I, I could give one really quick example, which is um, the, uh, the mining disaster that happened in, in Brazil last year. You, you could, at Frivali, you could imagine 25 years ago that, that that might not even have made Bloomberg or Reuters or what have you. Um, you know, it hit, it hit Bloomberg at 1110. It was on social media at 1050. Um, it was out in the open. And it wasn't who happened to be at Bloomberg and who wasn't Bloomberg. It was all over social media. So I think there's all, you know, all sorts of cool implications. You know, someone asked me once, aren't you worried about uh, AI and digital and all that? And that you, the investing is going to become mechanized and what have you. I'm actually really excited about it because we have this opportunity to get information, better information, faster than we used to. And it is driving market pricing as well. So I, I yeah, I completely agree with that. It's really very interesting. It brings, it almost, it's confusing at times too. It brings so many central, so many issues to 
you have to discern and delineate which ones are important. But if you can create, if some of those things create a market event and the fundamentals really haven't changed, it's an opportunity. So I've seen uh, more pricing moves since this digitalization has come on. And you have to understand, have the fundamentals changed, or is this just a market move based on some new information? Thank you. Other questions? So over there. the microphone will make its way to you. Is this on? Yeah. How does that affect a market like Chile with the events in the last month compared since 85, 97? Not the way you would have expected yet. So, um, you know, we've, we've seen the transparency, we've seen the information, and the market's had the ability to react, and it really hasn't. Um, and, and I would say not yet. And I, and I think that's similar in Peru. It's like, you know, we've, we've been able to watch this unfolding of a constitutional crisis. Um, you know, they have, you know, they have special prisons in Peru for former presidents. And I think five of the last, you know, presidents are in jail on the way to jail or shot themselves on the way to jail. It, you know, the problem is uh, that's all available to us and we see it. And in the world that we live in, this liquid world and this, this, this complacency world, it hasn't mattered. And I, you know, I wish we had polling software because if I described Peru and I asked you, like, what spread do you think that trades at? Um, you know, you would, you know, most people told me six, seven, eight hundred. Today it trades at around 40 over. And that's because of Chile, because Chile's at 35. And so Chile's like perceived to be the best credit in the market. That's the anchor for the, uh, the uh, compression trade, so to speak. Um, and until that blows out, the rest of it stays the same. Well, you pick on Chile. Let me pick on Hong Kong. How, how do both of you think about Hong Kong? Is it systemic? I, I've just noted, uh, so from a top-down point of view, in, in relation to Chile, I, I think the market is writing off this idea of some elements of security lit risk and political instability. So Hong Kong falls into this category. And Hong Kong, of course, has fiscal stimulus it can add to, to offset some of the economic pain. But there's, it's really hard, it's increasingly difficult for me to price country risk as it pertains to political instability and some elements of security risk. So we talked about Saudi Arabia earlier today, half of the oil production being taken out, spreads are back to 125 or whatever they are, you know. So it's the, these, this idea of security and political risk are being discounted very heavily in the market. And I think that's one thing that's contributing to lower value, stretched valuations. Can you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, in the case of Hong Kong, what, what's clear to me is that we've seen a change in the state of nature in terms of the way that, that Hong Kong was perceived as a, as a safe harbor. Um, and I think we haven't seen the full implications of that, but we have seen quite a slowdown in, in some things. But, you know, the, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was like you could either go right to China and there was advantages and disadvantages of that, or you could kind of play it safe in Hong Kong. I think that play it safe is, has kind of, that's the change in the state of nature. And then back to digitalization, you know, we're only talking about it because, not really because it's necessarily on the news, because we all saw it on Instagram first. It's so modern. Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> Snapchat. I'm trying to keep up with you. <laughs> and probably to the extent that uh, President Xi gets further involved in Hong Kong, uh, that will be more of a reflection on China and what's going on in China, the power consolidation, than it will per se, I think, on Hong Kong over the near term. One last question. Okay, I'll take it. Robert, <laughs> and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to torture you a little bit. Um, Robert, you said it's going to happen, and it is a 20% leg down in EM, if I heard you correctly. Is that correct? I didn't say 20%. On average, in the past, it's been, I didn't say prospectively 20%, but yes, a, a dislocation will occur. Okay, uh, um, define um, first dislocation, because these days, 1% dislocation is so a dislocation. If, so on average, the nine of them have been down about 20%. So, you know, e either side of that, a material dislocation, not what people say today, like, wow, the market got wasted. It was down 30 bips yesterday or 2 or 3%. I'm talking about something meaningful, 10, 15, 20%. Okay, and then I'm going to leave you a wiggle room. Um, within what period? Can I ask my uh, senior advisor? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Within what period? Um, inside of three to five years, my last uh, I think it's it's uh, you know it's I'll give the same answer I give to regime change in in Venezuela. It tends to uh, happen later than you expect, and then it happens sooner than you were expecting. But you know I, I would say that um, 
You know, I think you'll see something meaningful in the next 12 to 24 months. This is so countercultural. I didn't wear a tie because I thought I was coming to Greenwich and you know hedge funds and relax. Everybody's in a tie, including the hedge fund person. Um, I thought Greenwich was supposed to be specific. You, you sound more like Washington DC Foreign Service. <laughs> you don't want to give us anything more than that? Okay, Rebecca, do you agree that it's coming? Uh, it, it seems inevitable. Uh, there's just, it's been too much of a one-way street. We've had small liquidity events. Uh, we were talking about Q4 of 2018, something like that magnified could be coming. Uh, the global central banks are less and less capable of propping up the markets. I mean, it's eventually fundamentals have to take over. Earnings are slowing. Um, the economy is slowing. That seems undoubtable to me. Um, so unless so the earnings plan, are- given, given that institutionally you said it's very hard to buy when, when prices have just gapped. Yeah. How, if you think it's inevitable, quote unquote, how do you plan for it? Well, unfortunately, we're not in a great position to plan, but we would have to start allocating now toward emerging markets and being very specific about not where we want to be per se, but what we want to be in. Um, unfortunately, the fundamentals right now just, to me, don't justify it. So until I get a little bit more comfortable with uh, China's uh, next year and a half to two years fundamentals, until I get a little bit more comfortable with the U.S. election cycle, I, I think we're not going to be big into allocating ahead of that. So, Robert, what's the structural solution to the behavioral problem of you don't allocate when you really need to allocate? It's it, it's psychology. I mean, it's I mean, you talked about it before, which is in, in your panel this morning. If we have these two different outcomes, uh, why not just talk about it now? I mean, you know, everyone's been belly aching for years that there's no volatility. I can't make any money with volatility, and then volatility comes, and everybody freaks out and they hide out under the table. So whatever it is, and, and you know, it has been happening already. You know, it can happen on a idiosyncratic basis in different countries. You know, mm -hmm. it happened in Turkey last year. It's happening in Argentina today. It happened in Brazil. Um, and I think you could have anticipated all three of those, and you could have underwritten it ahead of time. The psychology is like, yeah, wow, that 105 cent bond, if it ever went to 40, of course I would want to buy it. Then it goes to 40, it's like, no, no, no. They, they, everyone takes the same amount, the same information, the difference between a bull market and a bear market is just what interpretation you put on it. But I think you, the way you have to set up it's, and you were talking with Jillian about, it's about psychology. It's about, it's going to happen, right? And just embrace the fact that it's going to happen and embrace that as an opportunity and underwrite that opportunity and then stick with your plan. Okay. Um, we have two minutes and the bit that I hate when I'm on the receiving end, but I love that I'm not on the receiving end. Okay. Here's the rules. You can only say long or short. Okay, that's the only answer that's admissible. We didn't talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, only four questions. Ladies first. <laughs> you ready? We want to, you can volunteer Robert first. Oh, no, I'm fine. Okay. We'll see what I come up with. U.S. recession sometime by the end of next year. Is the answer high probability? What is the answer? Yeah, yes, long, no short. No. Oh, yes, long. Okay, Robert. By the end of next year, tw yeah. 2020, yes. Okay. Um, down 20% in emerging markets by mid-year next year. No. No? no. Okay. A clarifying question because emerging markets is a broad label. In the, emerging market, <laughs> in the emerging market, I'll give you the bond index. Down 20% in the next 12 months? Yeah. No. And in the EM equity? Perhaps. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't give you the distinction. So bonds and, and, and equity. I was answering bonds. Okay. And equities? I think it's, there's fair evidence that earnings are slowing, so yes. Okay. Is Argentina a buy or sell? That's a firm hold until better understanding of the stra <laughs> strategy. I don't remember firm hold being... Being in so look, Argentina, you, there's a lot to love about Argentina on the medium to long term basis, but I just need to be more comfortable with that. that that's actually going to happen over the next two to three years. Confi and that's why we let people Confidently, like this do that. yes. Okay. Sorry for this. President Trump gets reelected. <gasps> yes. Yes. Join me in thanking our two panelists.
The 2019 Greenwich Economic Forum is brought to you by Bridgewater Associates. Meaningful work, meaningful relationships. Churchill Asset Management, Nuveen, a leading provider of senior and uni trench debt to middle market companies. Ropes and Gray, bright past, brilliant future. Aurora Capital, inspiring partnerships. And Gramercy Funds Management, we are emerging markets. Special considerations to Bank of America, life's better when we are connected. NOAA Private Wealth Management, a leading wealth and asset management service provider in China. Gotai Jinan Futures, a leading brokerage firm for commodity futures and financial futures in China. China Industrial Securities, a comprehensive financial group providing full-spectrum financial services in Hong Kong. And Titan Advisors, built like a hedge fund. Special thanks to the Financial Times and Greenwich Business Institute for hosting us. And thank you to all the sponsors who helped make this event possible. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away.